Why don't Americans know who's manipulating our political system and why? Uh, that's the headline over at HartmanReport.com today. I also uh, posted it over on Daily Coats. Excuse me. And, you know, I've been thinking about this for a while, and I, 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 I've been wanting to put it down on paper, and so I finally did yesterday, uh, or put it down into a computer file, I guess you'd say, these days. Um, you know, for, for a long time, we've talked about what, where is the origin of this hyper-racist, nativist, uh, fascist-loving, MAGA uh, faction that has largely taken over the Republican Party. Where, where did it start? Where did this come from? Um, and on this program and in some of my writings, I have pointed to the Brown versus Board of Education ruling by the Supreme Court in 1954 that desegregated America's schools, or at least said we had to. Uh, it didn't, but, you know, uh, that was the effect. It was the, that was what it was trying to do. But that's really only half the story. Um, the other half of the story, almost nobody knows. And that is that in the in, in the 1960s, America was suffering from a, a, a very real environmental crisis. And we were starting to wake up to it. In 1962, Rachel Carson uh, published Silent Spring, which is a book about how DDT was destroying the ability of birds to, to have hatchable eggs. And thus, you know, one day we would have a spring where there were no birds chirping, you know, in, in, in the spring. And it shocked people. It created the, it was about DDT, it, was, it created the first nationwide environmental movement and led to legislation outlawing DDT, in fact. Um, in 1960, oh, in the following year, 1963, uh, smog killed 400 people in New York City. And uh, in 1963, Lake Erie was declared dead. In 1969, a spark from a passing train lit the Cuyahoga River on fire. And that same year, a massive oil spill off the coast of California fouled 400 square miles of beach and coastline, killing thousands or millions of birds and other wildlife. Car exhaust, report, uh, re, uh, scientists reported in 1969, was so severe in America, it was causing birth defects and cancer. Major American cities like St. Louis smelled like Time Magazine reported at the time, like an old-fashioned drugstore on fire. I remember 1973, I think it was, I had gotten my pilot's license, and Louise and I rented a, a, a little, uh, 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 it was a Cherokee Arrow, was the, it was the airplane, uh, Cherokee 4175 Tango. And uh, we flew it from Lansing, Michigan, out to Los Angeles. And I remember the approach into the, it wasn't LAX, it was one of the, uh, the Hollywood Airport or the Burbank or whatever it was. But I remember on approach coming into there, you could see this dome, this orange dome over Los Angeles. You could, I mean, literally, it was like the, the city was covered by this orange cloud. Um, that was in the 70s. And so Richard Nixon, you know, came along and, and in response to public pressure. I mean, Richard Nixon was not a stupid guy. He was a very canny politician. Um, he created in 1969 the Environmental Quality uh, Council and then in 1970 the Environmental Protection Agency. Now, the what that did was produce an immediate backlash from the very, very wealthy oligarchs of American industry, particularly the fossil fuel and the chemical industry oligarchs, who hated the EPA right from the get-go. Uh, I, I mean, they felt persecuted because, I, I, after all, their, their fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers, uh, you know, uh, uh, metaphorically speaking, their predecessors in these industries had been able to pour unlimited amounts of poison into our air and into our rivers and into our lakes and, and into our soils and things, you know, with no consequence at all. Didn't have to pay a penny, weren't regulated, and that's what they wanted too, you know. This was hurting them. It was hurting their profits. And they were seriously pissed off about it. So what they did was they, they decided to take Russell, uh, excuse me, to take uh, Lewis Powell's advice. In 1971, Lewis Powell wrote this memo to Eugene Sindor, his neighbor and the head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And in it, he said, you know, rich people have been apolitical since World War II, and they need to get back into politics like they were in the 1920s and 30s, you know, producing the Republican Great Depression. They need to get back into politics, and they need to uh, buy up the media, 
They need to use their endowments to, to install right-wing professors in colleges across the country. Um, they need to create think tanks and influence public opinion. They need to have an army of writers and, and, and public influencers who can write op-eds and letters to the editor and all kinds of things. And, you know, and, and so the billionaires took their advice. They created a network of think tanks. There's one in every state in the union, plus a whole bunch of national ones that were dedicated basically to trash talking the EPA. And the other big thing that these billionaires at the time in the 1970s absolutely hated, which was the fact that after they took $3 million a year in income, they started paying 74% income tax on every penny after $3 million in today's money. And they were very upset about that. So they, they, you know, they started this campaign, or they started, they built this infrastructure. Um, you know, after uh, uh, Reagan in 1983 ordered the SEC, the DOJ, and the, and the FTC to stop enforcing the antitrust laws, and then after Clinton in 1996, for radio, television, and newspapers, uh, radio and TV stations, uh, what we saw was, you know, in very, very short order, certainly by the year 2000, 1,500 right-wing radio stations, Fox so-called news, um, you know, the, 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 all of these think tanks ha having their stuff regularly published in newspapers and magazines and things, the, the creation of brand new publications, all pushing this idea that the EPA was evil, that deregulation was a terrible thing, that we need deregulation, and, and that if you cut taxes on rich people, it will produce prosperity through this thing called supply side and trickle down. And they just pushed this, you know, aggressively throughout the 70s. So when Reagan came into office in 1981, he was able to actually implement these policies. And, uh, you know, and, and Trump did too. In fact, Trump gutted over 100 major EPA rules and regulations. The New York Times kept a list of them. There's a hot link to it in, in, you know, from my article. And this is, this is what I, you know, I think most Americans don't realize, is that these poor Republican voters who have been, I mean, all of this, I mean, literally billions of dollars and the labor of tens of thousands of people over the last 40 years has been devoted to convincing Republican voters that cutting taxes on rich people and doing away with regulations that protect their children from poisons is a, is a good thing. That, that we need to do away with these regulations because they're communism, don't you know, or socialism. And that we need to cut taxes on billionaires even more, I, even though the average billionaire in America right now is only paying 3% income taxes. We need to cut the taxes even more. And so what you, what you ended up with by 2015, 2016, you know, 40 years, 45 years into this process, was Republican voters who had been so thoroughly lied to, so thoroughly, essentially indoctrinated. You know, they believed Rush Limbaugh when he pitched this stuff. They believed Sean Hannity when he, when he makes these arguments that, you know, regulations are communism and, and uh, taxes on rich people are a drag on the economy and all this kind of stuff. They believed that stuff. And the, the consequence of that, or the result of that, is that they, they you know, they, they've been made into marks. They've been made gullible. These, these poor Republican voters, they're just like suckers. And so along comes a professional con man, a guy who has literally spent his entire life being a hustler, a grifter, a salesman, Donald Trump comes in and says, I will save you from everything. And gives, you know, wildly contradictory uh, uh, positions. You know, he was, he was going to give everybody in America health care that was better than Obamacare. He was going to raise taxes on rich people so much that they wouldn't, his rich friends wouldn't talk to him anymore. Uh, he was going to bring back our jobs from overseas and he was going to help revive the union movement. In fact, he put an anti-union lawyer, uh, Scalia's son, as the head of the Labor Department. He, he uh, trashed the, the environmental regulations. 
He cut taxes on billionaires rather than raise them. He raised taxes on average working people. He, I, I, I mean, it's just, it was all lies. But, you know, the people who voted for him, they, they're just so used to being lied to by right-wing billionaires. And make no mistake about it, Donald Trump is a right-wing billionaire too. They're just so used to being lied to by these very, very wealthy people that they just kind of take it. You know, they just absorb the lies and go, oh, yeah, okay. So, you know, I guess, what do you have to say? You know, well done, right-wing billionaires. Thanks for nothing. But I, I think that this story, this 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 50-year-long uh, plot, uh, essentially, executed by some of uh, America's richest men, uh, really needs to be told. And so I told it today at Hartman Report.